introduction. We three are delighted to be here today, and it is my pleasure to have Agnes Roford with Accor and Ellie Giannis with Radisson. And both of these individuals are the global chief development officers for multi-billion dollar hospitality companies that have a varied portfolio, a myriad of brands within their brief. And so we're delighted to be here to talk about the future and leading the change vis-a-vis -vis global development for the hospitality industry. Agnes and um, Ellie, thank you for joining us today. So can we begin, maybe you wanna each begin by telling us a little bit about how you evaluate risk in each of your global roles and um, for the future, how you plan to really evaluate what is appropriate going forward for each of your brands. Agnes? Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm super glad to be uh, here, to be back after uh, one year and uh, to be in this uh, amazing and fast growing region where indeed taking risk is essential uh, to take a great position and develop our, our brands. Um, I would say that first, you know, um, when we're saying risk, I'm thinking about innovation, about spirit of conquest, and I think that is part of our industry. This is even in the value of Accor. So we have that here in, uh, in our mind, in our heart, in our soul, in our guts. Um, and so in it having this entrepreneur mindset, taking, uh, let's say, uh, calculated risk is, uh, is important. So I think given the audience in the room, uh, everybody knows how we assess uh, the risk with a net present value, WAC, IR, uh, so very traditional, so it's in the book. Uh, so you have the data, you enter in the machine and say, go, no, go. But it's going beyond that. Uh, uh, we're going beyond that. And so I, I think one thing which is important for us, and we have some example, is uh, how a deal uh, an hotel, an investment in a hotel, or let's say um, an acquisition, will contribute to accelerate our vision. And I would take a, a recent example uh, we had. Uh, we have invested recently in the trains, which is part of the travel industry, but not really our core business. And so, of course, it's, it's a risk. But the thing that it will bring to our brand, particularly Orient Express brand, going beyond the hotel, bringing to the, to, to the travel, you know, is something which is not completely measurable. And so, of course, there are the financial indicator that we know all, that we're using all, uh, but there is much more about the vision and the values uh, a deal can bring, uh, can bring to us. Excellent. And of course, you have to get to your properties, right? So whether it's by train, walking, airplane, uh, trains are good. Ellie, from your perspective? Yeah, the, the reality is that I, I have, and many people do have, this, this love-hate relationship with, uh, with risk. And, and I choose, or we choose to see it uh, from the opportunity angle. So what is the opportunity that is associated to the risk, rather than looking at at the risk itself. Of course, risk has two faces, the good and the bad, and you have to look at the two faces of it to do your job right. The bad, naturally, is the, the wrongful results that may come out of it, and there's a chance that happened. But there's a lot of good about it because risk makes you prepare and oftentimes makes you innovate to get and unlock the value that you see in, in that opportunity. And of course, there are various elements that would contribute to how your attitude is towards risk that are timeless. You have to look at these attributes to it, irrespective, most likely, of the time that you, that you live in. And those attributes are perspective. What is the risk that I'm looking at? What is it? What is at stake? What is the opportunity associated to, uh, to that risk? Am I looking at it from a something to gain perspective? Or am I looking at it from something to risk perspective, risking my business? And the more usually that you look at it at something that you will gain, the more daring you would likely be when compared to eventualities or risk associated to your existing business. The second element is quantification, and you said it in a different way, Agnes, and that is the, the how much. How much am I looking at? How much am I looking at winning? And what is at stake? How much may I lose 
into that equation. So, and what are the odds? And the different the odds, your, 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 your evaluation may, may be different vis-a-vis uh, -vis that. And the last point probably is your knowledge. You have to know uh, about the subject associated to that risk. And the more you know about it, and the more we know about it, the, more, the, the higher the chances for you to take that risk. A little example, it's a personal example. A few years ago, somebody came to me, asking me to invest in Bitcoins. And it was such a risk-free deal because I had to invest one day and then sell it after a year. And it looked excellent on paper, but I just had no clue about Bitcoins. So I said, no, I don't want to invest that because I don't understand it. I don't, I, I don't feel comfortable with that because I don't understand it. However, give me something that I understand, an industry that I understand, and your risk tolerance suddenly will improve. So, so risk, uh, I would say, is something that exists. Better to look at it from the opportunity perspective rather than from the bad element associated to it. Well, thank you both for that. Warren Buffett says he never invests if he doesn't understand. So there's something to that. And I think we live in a day and age of perpetual evolution. And depending on your individual appetite and corporate appetite, some may say change is good. But I think in your roles, change and risk is, is obviously a key. And of course, it's better to dare to fail than fail to dare when you do a calculated risk evaluation. So let me ask you, in this entrepreneurial mindset, I think that each of you take in your roles, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, how much is data such a key element, and where and how do you extract your data for your risk evaluations? And yes? Yeah, the data, we are lucky in our industry, and the presentation before us is a good illustration to have a lot of data. So we have this chance to, to be able, at the beginning, to leverage a lot of data, financial data, market data, guest feedback that we're using a lot to understand a project, particularly when we have a conversion. We're looking a lot at what is saying the guest about the destination, the location, and assessing the best brand fit. So that is important for us, and we are improving every day. I love data, so it's a blessed industry for that. Uh, but again, I would say, if we have access to the same data all, so if we are just uh, ticking the box of the data, with Ellie, probably we will do the same deal, <laughs> or fighting for the same deal. Our, our life won't be as you know, passionating as it is. So we have to take into consideration all the things. One, which is, of course, hyper important for us, is our partner, uh, the partner we have in front of us, the investor, because depending on the profile of the partner, if we know the partner very well, we will be able to take more risk with him or with her. If it's a new one, if it's a new destination, um, well, the risk will be uh, assessed differently. And this is what is funny about how we're different companies. I will give you an example which is pretty historical. Looking at some countries where there is a big inflation, where it is risky, I will quote South America because I was there uh, not so far ago. It's, it's a super risky, but we are very proud to have taken this risk and taking this risk make us leaders there now. But it was, you know, a high risk and not all companies have uh, accepted to, to take it. And sometimes we have missed other <laughs> opportunities. So that's, that makes us, uh, our job great. We have a lot of data, so starting with data, but then appealing to the guts, the heart, our value, and what, what is in line with our, with our vision, where we want to go, where we want to push. And that's probably, at the end, the most important in the decision making. And fortunately, what makes us different between uh, Ellie and myself and between uh, you know, our two companies. Thank you. Merci. Ellie? Yeah, I think um, the, the data is certainly very important. And it's all about the, the it's a lot of it is all about data and market evaluation and, and risk evaluation. But at the end of the day, you need to translate all of that into information. Information about what is it that I'm looking at here to the executive team, and what is the business plan, what is the business case, and what are the risk factors associated to that uh, business case. You can have a systematic approach to that. Uh, 
not necessarily sequential, but a systematic approach. And at the end of the day, I would look at three things. The first one is the underlying assumptions. I think it's very important to, to really evaluate your, your underlying assumptions. Uh, a lot of mistakes are made because of those underlying assumptions, not because of the data itself. Who's the owner? Uh, it is probably more critical than the data. You can, you can probably go wrong on a project, but you cannot afford going wrong with your partner. And the last point beyond data is you have to question yourself about your ability to execute, which many people sometimes overlook. Data is fine, the numbers are, co are good. Can we execute it? Do we have the right people, the right resources, the right enablers and capabilities to execute it? Because unless you ask yourself that question thoroughly, chances are that you will likely make, uh, make a mistake. So that would be my, my approach to that. Excellent. Thank you both for that. And you know, making a mistake, I always say, is it really a mistake? Because there's opportunity in everything. And so lessons to be learned and how to perpetually be better and grow and go forward. And you both represent, you know, billion dollar companies. So have you ever taken a risk in each of your roles where I don't want to say that it didn't work out, but that perhaps the outcome was not what you had projected, be it the I RR not being what you had projected, ROI, or you know, from values or other reasons, it didn't work out. And if that was the case, what lessons were learned? Ellie, you want to begin? Agnes, please. Agnes? Yeah, I love what you're saying. It's learning by failing. It's our daily job. I mean, you know, if you're talking, you, you were mentioning, Ellie, a business plan. Honestly, the accuracy of our business plan, we're doing our best and we're all doing our best, but you have always, you know, some uh, issues of accuracy and that's fine. And I will give you some examples. There is a huge difference between a market where you have many hotels in franchise, in a destination you can have up to 40, 50, 100 hotels. That happens, for example, in Europe or in North America for other groups you are able to really forecast what will be you know, the, your, your business plan uh, by more or less 5% accuracy. That's amazing. But when you have new project, particularly in this region, when you're building you know, from scratch new cities, new projects, having you know, a strong accuracy as mentioned, that's super difficult. So, we are, if we're just trying to have this 5% accuracy, let's stop to you know, develop and have business. That's not possible, just in some areas. But this is where we have this uncertainty. And that's fine to live with that, but to know it, to just to know it. And then when we're saying learning uh, by failing, the important thing is to measure afterwards what we have done with sincerity, you know, saying, okay, we were wrong, why? And to improve constantly. And to integrate the fact that we can be wrong from the beginning. So we have our base case, stress case, necessarily in evaluating our risk, because we know, and with a huge humility after the, the COVID years we have experienced, that, you know, big things, big bad things can happen. And that's important to integrate that and be transparent from the beginning, both with the partners and the investor, and inside <laughs> for those that, well, we validate our projects. So that's important to integrate that as a given. We will fail. There is, you know, let's say 80% of the project, they happen as we have planned. But 20% we take in this risk, and that can be a huge success beyond expectation. And as well, we can have uh, you know, some failure. The important thing is to integrate it from the beginning and to measure afterwards and to improve constantly. 
And that, you know, 20% of something is better than 100% of nothing. So that's a good track record when you succeed 20% of the time. I would also say that that mindset plays to a corporate culture. You have to have a safety net to say, it's okay if we fail. We're one team and let's move forward together, learn from it and carry on. Ellie, in your experience? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's inevitable to fail and um we have not made, we have not experienced a lot of these uh, situations, but we luckily did experience quite a number of them. It's impossible. I was, I was counting earlier today how many deals I was, uh, that we have done for the last 10 years. And I was, I counted around 600. And how can you do 600 hotels without making mistakes? We'll be silly fools sitting here saying, oh, there was no mistakes. Everything happened on plan. Life doesn't work like that. So there have been mistakes and we learned from these mistakes, and I share a couple of them, like concretely here, just uh, just out of uh, sharing. Uh, early in my career, we made a few mistakes because of greed. Greed, when you simply look at the deal because of its interest to you, without really looking at the ability of the other party to perform. And here is where afterwards you learn that we must do transactions with, 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 the, with the other side being able to perform. Choosing your partners is as important as choosing the deals. Other learnings, also early in my career, were mainly based on, on lack of thoroughness in your underlying assumptions. And you make mistakes with that. You overassume your abilities to deliver. You overassume the market ability to produce the demand that you expect to produce. And those, if you, make, if you are not thorough in your underlying assumptions, I made mistakes and I admit it. But what happens when you make the mistake? You sit down, you learn, you take responsibility, and you move on. And this is what happens. And most importantly, to your point about culture earlier in these situations, is to have a culture that tolerates mistakes. You must tolerate mistakes because if you don't do that, especially if you have the right people and good people, you kill their guts. You get their ability to take initiative and eventually you compromise your innovation, which is deadly. So accepting mistakes is part of the game. Absolutely, it's critical because you, you have to create that culture, otherwise you won't grow together. And I think two things are important with regard to risk. Timing, timing is everything, right? Imagine if you just made a major, major investment in March of 2020 and it was relying on cash flow and the industry imploded for an unknown period of time which evolved to arguably six months to two years. Timing, I would imagine, is another risk factor always. And you said something important about greed. You know, companies, and in this day and age of activist investors and ESG, I just recently read the Hard Rock Hotel chain. They just did a several hundred million dollar investment to raise all of their employees, to give them a raise with inflation. And Patagonia, a different, not a hospitality company, but certainly your guests would wear Patagonia clothing. They're giving the company away for charity, so no greed there. But uh, it's hard to believe we're almost out of time. So one quick last question, how important is is ESG in this day and age and aligning those values? Agnès? Yeah, you know, for me, ESG is the next big revolution of our sector. Uh, today, tourism is unfortunately considered as a predator to nature, and we have to reverse that. We have to become a contributor. And I'm a strong believer that we can do it. I don't know yet completely how, but we have to change really this, uh, this deal. And so, you know, for, for sure, as developers, it's a bit frightening because for sure, we will have to change the way we are doing things. I will give you an example. You know, one of the dreams of the developers, just a few years and still probably five years ago, was when there was a desert island, a desert beach, was to put a great hotel on it. Today, you know, it's not super ESG compliant and we have to think completely differently. Of course, we're dreaming of having fantastic brand, fantastic hotel, you know, in some places 
that have to be discovered, and there are many projects in progress, but we have to rethink completely the way we will do it. And so introducing ESG you know, criteria in our development is essential and vital. Not only the guests are asking for it, and so if we're not doing it, if we destroy the nature and the Virgin Island with our hotel, we, the, the, the guests will not forgive us. But on top of that, and it will help us, the funding, the financing, the bank themselves will push, and the insurance will push us to make our job differently. And so step by step, because we're learning by working, we are all at learning, uh, we have at Accor, everybody has to be trained with uh, nearly 10 hours training to be aware, to understand the key stakes and to go to the action now. So we're introducing step by step ESG component, ESG criteria of assessment and of, of the risk. But of, for me, this is the next revolution. Digital was the one 10 years ago. This is uh, the revolution of ESG. Excellent, thank you. Ellie, ESG at Radisson and your team? Very short on ESG because Agnes summarized it very well. I think, I think uh, the G has always been there. I think it has, that never, never has the G been compromised, I think, over the last 10, 15 years, or it shouldn't have been. The E and the S is where I think there has been, there's been increasing awareness by the companies, by all stakeholders, by lenders, by the customers, by, by investors. We see more and more institutional investors in Europe and in other mature markets. They just want to invest in projects with high E and S barometers. So really, it is the next thing. It is not just the next thing for the sake of it. It's the next thing because we want to leave the planet uh, livable for our children. So we have a responsibility to do that. And I just want to share the last point about the, the subject about risk and risk taking before we move on. Um, learning that I had in my career, and I just wish to share it, the best risk you can take is not on a project. The best risk you can take is on people. When you find and identify a young talent and take a risk and invest in them, give them an opportunity to take and see them, them grow, take that opportunity and become leaders of themselves. This is probably has the best return on investment when compared to any deal you have ever done in my life. This is my humble experience in this taking. Well, thank you both. I can't believe we're out of time already. And I will say that there is obvious reasons why both of you are in the roles that you are in because you are leading the change and the future of hospitality in each of your brands and portfolios is certainly right. I would hope one takeaway is that you have to take risk and that always take a calculated risk, but to focus on the future and the perpetual evolution. The clients change, the needs change, and risk will always change. Uh, so uh, Jonathan and the bench, thank you for having us today. Agnes and Ellie, thank you for being such wonderful panelists, and we wish you all a great conference. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eddie. Thanks a lot. <laughs>